Yes. So we're back with some more stories today. And yesterday we learned about trouble coming to the earth. And it's lovely how those Greeks gave all the women the um, blame for being the trouble. We were actually, according to Greek mythology, we were given to man as punishment. Oh well. Uh, we also learned the origin of Pandora's box. That's kind of cool. Um, it had everything bad in it. She was told not to open it and she couldn't stand it. She had so much curiosity, she finally did and all the bad stuff came out, but luckily there was one good thing in the bottom of the box that she was able to hold on to and that was hope. So today we're gonna look at two stories and that means tomorrow you guys are gonna have some questions over these three stories, yesterday's and the two that I'm gonna look at with you today. And today we're going to look at, um, this one's about the seasons changing. And that's good because, you know, we're kind of early on in spring and we're getting into summer. And we live in a region that you never can tell what season is. It changes pretty much from day to day. But I think you'll enjoy this one too. It's called Why the Seasons Change. Demeter, kindly goddess of the harvest, loved her daughter Persephone very dearly. The girl was like springtime itself. Warm breezes hovered tenderly about her and flowers sprang up beneath her dancing feet. Even the birds sang more sweetly as she came near. When Hades, god of the underworld, saw the maiden, he too loved her and decided to make her his queen. Her happy laughter would bring gaiety even to his somber home in the land of darkness, but he knew that she would never go willingly with him. One day, when Persephone was in the meadows, she strayed away from her companions to pick some unusually beautiful blossoms near a grassy riverbank. Just as she reached out her hand, she heard a deep rumble. The earth was opening up beside her. From the chasm came a chariot drawn by smoky black steeds and driven by the stern-faced god of the underworld. Strong arms seized her and swept her into the chariot. Instantly, the earth closed over them as the horses sped into the dark realms below. Demeter, though far away, heard her daughter Persephone's anguished cry and hastened to her aid, but she could find nothing except the girl's arm full of flowers scattered in wild confusion over the meadow. Frantically, Demeter searched night and day for her daughter, and in her grief she could not attend to her duties, and soon all growing things began to wither and die from neglect. Zeus sent Iris, the rainbow, to persuade her to resume her work. But the heartbroken goddess said only, I can do nothing until I find my daughter. Then Zeus knew that he had to rescue Persephone or the whole earth would perish. His messenger, Hermes, sped on winged sandals from Mount Olympus down to the gloomy palace of Hades. And here he found the god of the underworld upon his ebony throne with Persephone, his unhappy queen, beside him. Hades, who was also god of wealth, had tried to make her happy by lavishing gold and precious gems upon her, but she found them a poor substitute for the sun, the moon, and the stars. The dark cypress groves surrounding the palace made her sick with longing for the bright-leaved trees of earth. Sadly, she contrasted the gardens of ghostly, pale asphodel, the only flowers that would grow in the underworld, with the narcissi, the violets, the purple crocuses, and pink roses she had loved so dearly. Hades also had tried to please her with all kinds of delicious food and drink, but she had eaten nothing since coming to the underworld until that very day that Hermes came to demand her release. Then, in her eagerness to start at once for Earth, she yielded to Hades' instant, insistent pleas that she eat with him just once. Impatiently, she had taken a pomegranate that he offered, swallowed just six of its seeds, but Hades knew that he had her now. He knew that she must now yield to the command of Zeus. His queen would not be forever lost to him. The fates had long ago decreed that whoever tasted food in his realm must return. So joyfully, Persephone journeyed with Hermes through the dark underworld, coming out at last into the fragrant air of earth. Soon she was clasped in her mother's loving arms, and all living things rejoiced with them. But a quick shadow fell over their happiness when Demeter inquired anxiously, "'Did you eat anything in the underworld?' Only six pomegranate seeds, Persephone replied. Oh, then, my daughter, you must return to Hades for six months out of every year, sorrowed the goddess. Nothing, not even Zeus himself, can alter the decree of the fates. And so it was that Persephone spent six months of the year with her mother. And during this time, Demeter was happy, and the golden wheat fields and the flower-spangled meadows reflected her joy. But when it was time for the girl to return to the underworld, 
Demeter's sorrow lay like a desolate cloud over the earth, making it cold and barren. Always, though, there was the comforting assurance to the goddess and to all mankind that Persephone would return, bringing the springtime with her. So, um, some of the stories, actually, of Persephone and Hades have it that they actually fall madly in love, and she loves him, um, and that she doesn't necessarily want to leave him. Um, I'm going to try to find this clip on YouTube that I used to show, or I, I do show whenever we have class in class. Um, I show it kind of like a nice little contrast to this, and if I can find the clip, I'm going to attach it to this story, okay? So... Now I am going to go to the other one, and this one is the um, third story that we're going to look at, and it is about Aphrodite. And you guys learned about Aphrodite because she's one of the ten Olympians I felt like you really needed to know. Now in the last story, they, we did have the messenger god, Hermes, and it looks like Hermes, um, and he is one of the other four. So he is an Olympian god, um, but he just wasn't one of the 10 that I had you guys like study some extra, okay? But now we're gonna look at a story about Aphrodite, okay? Some nymphs playing on the seashore one day saw a shining object floating toward them on the crest of the waves. As it came nearer, they saw that it was a large, delicately tinted shell and that it was being blown along by Zephyrus, the gentle west wind. The wave dissolved into lacy foam as it struck the shore, and from the shell emerged a maiden of dazzling beauty. The nymphs shyly welcomed her, clothed her in their own soft robes, wove garlands of roses for her hair, and gave her the reverence due to a queen. For she truly is a queen, said one, a queen of beauty. All who see her will love her, predicted another. Let us call her Aphrodite, which means born of the foam suggested a third, and all agreed that this was the proper name for the maiden who had come to them from the ocean waves. But soon they were to lose their lovely new companion, for when Zeus saw Aphrodite, he decided she was way too beautiful for the earth alone. She shall come to live with the immortals on Mount Olympus, he decreed, as our goddess of love and beauty. Hephaestus, and we know Hephaestus, he's the ugly god who by the end of this story, he's going to be married to her. But anyway, Hephaestus made her a palace of pearls. Um, Athena wove her silken rainbow-hued robes, and in her garden, Hera caused roses and myrtle to bloom and soft-voiced doves to sing. Zeus's gift was a chariot drawn by white swans. Hebe, goddess of youth and cupbearer to the gods, kept her supplied with nectar, ambrosia, and other delicacies of the immortals. Aphrodite soon learned to love the luxury and ease of her life on Mount Olympus, so she never forgot the earth from which she had come. Sometimes she would go down to stroll along the seashore or wander through the fragrant woodlands. On one of these visits, she caught sight of the handsome young hunter Adonis as he raced through the forest. Instantly, she fell in love with him. From then on, her luxurious Olympian palace was often vacant because she preferred to be down on earth with Adonis. She even put aside her silken robes for the simple dress of a huntress so that she might join him in his favorite sport. Although she gloried in his bravery as a great hunter, she often worried for his safety. For my sake, she pleaded, avoid the fierce animals and hunt only the deer that can do you no harm. But Adonis enjoyed excitement and danger far too well to content himself with just such mild sport. One day, soon after Aphrodite had left him, he tracked down a fierce boar. Hurling his javelin, he pinned the beast to the ground and then rushed forward to kill it. But just as he prepared to give it the death blow, the boar ripped out the javelin with its teeth, wheeled upon Adonis, and gored him again and again and again with its tusks. Iris the rainbow saw the bloody scene and hurried to tell Aphrodite. Down from Mount Olympus, along the Milky Way, sped the goddess to save him if she could. As she hastened along a woodland path, Past, excuse me, some white roses accidentally scratched her with their sharp thorns. So ashamed were they at having wounded the goddess of love and beauty that they blushed a deep red and have remained that color to this day. Aphrodite reached Adonis too late, and her bitter tears fell on a cold, still face. Sadly, she touched the drops of blood that had flowed from his wounds, and from each sprang a flower, a crimson anemone. You shall bloom each spring, she said, as a remembrance of Adonis, but your lives shall be short, just as his was. And from that time on, the blood-red anemones, or wind flowers, embroidered the fields with rich color every year, and the children look eagerly for their coming. 
It is Adonis returning to bless the earth with this beauty, they tell each other. But the blossoms die quickly, for the wind blows them open and robs them of their petals, just as unkind fate took the life of Adonis too soon. So, you might have heard of somebody um, being described as a regular Adonis, or, ooh, he's such an Adonis. Um, that's somebody who's like super, super good looking, um, exceedingly handsome is what the book says. So the name Adonis comes from Greek mythology and is usually described somebody who's super handsome. Um, and it's kind of cool. It says we remember Aphrodite chiefly through her Latin counterpart name, Venus, which of course uh, refers to a beautiful woman. Uh, the most radiant planet in the heavens also bears the name Venus. And um, roses and doves, the favorite flowers and birds of the goddess, became symbols of love and actually um, are still used a lot whenever there's love to be symbolized. Um, it says, just as Aphrodite sped down the Milky Way to the dying Adonis, all the gods and goddesses were believed to travel down that glowing pathway of stars on their journeys between Olympus and Earth. Hmm, that sounds a little bit familiar to some of our Norse mythology. So it's kind of cool how quite a bit of it goes from one to the other and then you find a lot of similarities. So look for some questions um, 